The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, those are the familiar words of the 23rd Psalm, words that have been really meaningful to a lot of us at different points in life. And those first five words of the psalm are kind of a headline for our conversations in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. The Lord is my shepherd. And for this study, we have a guest at the table with us who spent a good part of a year with Bedouin shepherds in the Middle East. And he's going to help us understand better what actually is a really common image in the Bible. Dr. Tim Laniak joins the Discover the Word group for some fascinating conversations about shepherds and shepherding and being shepherded. Discover the Word with us. And this is Discover the Word, a Bible engagement effort of Our Daily Bread Ministries, in which we invite you to be part of a group of friends that explore topics and passages of Scripture together in a way that shapes how we read the Bible and challenges us as we live our lives as followers of Christ. And uh, from our regular group of study partners, we have Elisa Morgan and Bill Crowder and Rasul Berry. And we also have a guest joining them at the table, Dr. Tim Laniak, recently joined us here at Our Daily Bread Ministries as our Senior Vice President of Global Content. It's good to have Tim on staff with us. Tim has also been a seminary professor and administrator. He's an author. He's the founder of a ministry called shepherdleader.com. And an interesting piece of trivia, Tim was at Gordon-Conwell Seminary when former Discover the Word group members Haddon Robinson and Alice Matthews were there. And so we share that connection. And so in this episode of the podcast, Tim is going to lead some conversations that will help us understand the depth of this shepherd and shepherding image that appears throughout the scriptures. He's written a book called The Good Shepherd, published by Our Daily Bread Publishing, that came out of that experience of being with Bedouin shepherds in the Middle East. I think his stories and insight are going to make this a memorable episode. And so let's listen as Bill welcomes Tim Laniak to Discover the Word. We're welcoming a new guest to the table, but we're also welcoming a new team member, relatively speaking, to Our Daily Bread Ministries, Tim Laniak. So tell us a little bit about yourself as we get started. Sure. I had a, a long-standing interest in culture and missions on one hand and in the Bible on the other, and they kind of came together when I took my first trip to Israel as a student and then went back again as a student and then went back again on a sabbatical to do research with shepherds. And at that point, understanding biblical leadership through the lens of the shepherd metaphor and the shepherd realities that I was studying about was just a game changer for me. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm curious, Sue, about the way you approach writing a book about this. You decided to write it as a in a devotional format, not just in a academic way, even though you are a PhD and professor. Why did you just choose to write it devotionally? On my sabbatical, I was at a archaeological research center and I did a book that was an academic book. Hmm. It's called Shepherds After My Own Heart, and it had a lot of exegesis, a lot of Bible textual analysis, and a lot of ancient Near Eastern background. Hmm. But when I came back, I started doing conferences and workshops and seminars with people that were interested in my pictures and my stories. Hmm. And so what I did was I recreated a journal that Hmm. has this feeling of these are the pictures I took, and these are the things that I wondered about or that I heard. So some of the stories are just completely surprising. Well, we'll talk about some of them, I'm sure, yeah. in these Good. sessions. Yeah. Good. Well, I look forward to hearing yeah. about it. Yeah. So it's a very personal and personalized invitation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. That's good. So with all of this conversation about your work on shepherds, hopefully you're going to talk with us about shepherds this week. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want to, sure. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> you know, of course, I ask the question, is shepherding relevant? Mm-hmm. But there's even maybe a prior question, which is, how important are metaphors in the Bible? Like, people love Psalm 23, but is that just like literary artistry where the real meat is all these great propositional statements Mm -hmm. about God? But I'm just curious what metaphors you think there are in the Bible that 
carry some pretty significant theological freight Mm -hmm. that we really need to spend time with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think of one just as a pastor, we use a lot as the body of Christ Mm -hmm. and us as a body, right? That's interdependent and that there's different strengths and weaknesses, right? That just stands out to me as a really powerful metaphor. Mm -hmm. Mm. And maybe obviously as we sit around the table at our daily bread, you know, I think about bread, you know, and sure. Jesus calling himself, I am the bread of life. So I think about that yeah. one. Yeah, you mentioned Psalm 23 and the shepherd metaphor for God. One of the things that's always intrigued me about that is that in many of David's Psalms, he uses inanimate metaphors, a rock, a shield, mm. a tower. This feels much more intimate mm-hmm. when he says the Lord is my shepherd. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And there's other ones, obviously, that are also personal and relational. You know, king, father, mm-hmm. even a creator, if you think more of a potter or a, mm-hmm. a mason, sure. a builder, you know, there's even intimacy in those too. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's helpful when you dig into metaphors, you realize that some of them bring into relationship things that we could keep separate. So if you think like a husband who has a wife, a father who has children, a builder who has a building, a shepherd who has a flock, then in some ways these metaphors, even though they might seem like they're just figures of speech, they actually have glue in them. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, my sense is that we might say, what is God or who is God? And we might say, well, if I went to seminary, they would teach me that he was omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. But if I say, well, the Bible talks more about God as a creator and as a father and as a king and as a shepherd and as a warrior, then it actually brings with it some luggage. Mm -hmm. And the luggage is that we're that partner. So having God as a shepherd automatically Mm -hmm. makes us ask the question, what does it mean to be sheep? Right. Mm -hmm. So it takes it from the kind of intellectual abstract and the metaphors allow us to really see ourselves in more intimate proximity to God himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I Mm -hmm. see that. Yeah. And it's, there's an irony to us having to do a little bit of research because what a metaphor did in the ancient world was it made God completely understandable immediately. Mm. It was like everyday knowledge. Right. So we're just trying to catch up with that background and that requires some you know, a little Digging. bit of homework. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, now I'm really curious to hear <laughs> how do you make it plain to us like the folks yeah. initially mm-hmm. would have heard it. Well, I wonder if you think about Psalm 23, what images are there in the imagery of the shepherd and the shepherd's son? What are the images that would have resonated with people with background that we might need to say, well, what actually mm. did that look like or mean? Yeah, I think for me, the thing that perhaps is most accessible to us, even 2,000 plus years removed, is also what many of the first hearers would have also resonated with, and that's the darkest valley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though I walk through the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Just that comforting presence Mm -hmm. on our darkest day. Yeah, actually trying to dig into the background of Psalm 23, you have to actually make your way through what I call the sentimental syrup that sometimes Mm -hmm. is dripping all over it because Mm -hmm. it's been so meaningful and it's so accessible even without knowing the background, but you almost have to say, well, what is that deep, deadly shadow? Your first instinct is, well, that's what people need to hear when they're in the hospital or that's what we prayed when we were Mm -hmm. going through this tough time. But they all have, whether it's the quiet waters, the deadly shadows, the rod, the staff, everything had a lot of everyday meaning for people that would have triggered more than sentiment, but it would have filled it and helped with the imagination. Hmm. Yeah, and that rod and staff comfort me always. You know, I've heard different things that rod could be corrective, but then it was like comforting at the same Mm -hmm. time. And Mm -hmm. in one sense, I feel like I could ascertain that in a broad way of how even when you're a child and having parents that give you rules and structure, There is a certain comfort in that, but in another sense, it doesn't feel very comforting at the time to be corrected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll have a chance to look at the staff in the second session and the rod in the third. Okay. Well, I wonder if you think about this psalm written by a king, if you think about King David writing a psalm, what is there in the first line that you think might have some important implications for us when we think about our leadership? Well, I guess I see him yielded to something Mm -hmm. higher and uh, how important that is 
for the king to still have a shepherd, for us to understand we ourselves need to be led as we lead others. Yeah, and you kind of see the photographic negative of that in church leadership today, who pastors the pastors, Mm -hmm. you know. Shepherds need to be shepherded too. Shepherds Mm -hmm. need someone to invest in them and care for them and provide for them as well. And the king also needs a shepherd. Mm. So it's kind of interesting Mm -hmm. that in the Bible, David's actually never called the shepherd of Israel the way those kings were all, you know, king of Babylon, king of Egypt, king of all the different countries in Mesopotamia. Just they they were always called the shepherd. Mm. But God says to David, I will call you, it says in Psalm 78, verse 70 to 72, he chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. Mm. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. Mm. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. So David was called to shepherd. It's kind of a verb, but it's God's flock and the people of God's pasture. Just like it's really contained. Mm -hmm. And David makes two big mistakes in his ministry as king. And both of them showed a certain amount of royal pretense and arrogance and abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, there's an interesting way that a prophet has to kind of show David that. Even using that metaphor of lamb. Yeah. 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 In the uh, black church tradition, there's a longstanding framework of referring to the pastors as under shepherds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. there's that framework of okay, you have leadership, but you're still submitted to a greater shepherd. And it sounds like that's what Mm. is being pointed to in Psalm 78 and even 23. Yeah, and I think probably the the takeaway for all of us is that, first of all, in a setting like like this, we talk about leadership. We're all leaders. We all have responsibility for other people. You can be parents, you can be coaches, you can be working in an environment where you're a supervisor, but almost everybody has responsibility for someone else, even if it's only for a period of time. And usually there's more than one set of people that we have responsibility for. And it's not just a matter of like, I have delegated responsibility, but that it's God's family. It's like yeah. God's church. So the church isn't just doesn't just have a pastor appointed by God and then God stays back. It's more like, does the pastor actually look to God and say, what are you doing as the shepherd of this congregation? So... When we get to John 10, I think it'll be more important to pay attention to how Jesus said, my sheep, they listen to my voice, they hear my voice, they know my voice, because I think that's part of the magic in a way of leadership. And my favorite word is now discern. Just, I don't have plans in leadership as much as I'm trying to discern God's plans. You know, are we the hands and feet of God? So that's probably starting with David and Psalm 23, one is a good place to start. I think that is a good place to start. Having those familiar first five words of Psalm 23 be the headline over this episode. The Lord is my shepherd. Looking forward to more stories and insights from Dr. Tim Laniak as he joins Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Rasul Berry at the table for these conversations called The Good Shepherd as we explore this important metaphor we see throughout Scripture of sheep and shepherds. Now, in the next part of the conversation, Tim will tell us about a really insightful answer that he got to a question he asked one of those Bedouin shepherds. Tim asked, what is it that makes a shepherd a really good shepherd? Well, the answer was insightful, but uh, it also contained a surprisingly generous offer. I had another amazing encounter with a Bedouin who I interviewed more than once because he was just so good. And I brought my son, who was only 12. I said, you know, what does it take to be a good shepherd? And he said, you got to have a heart for it. If you don't have the heart for it, don't be in it. So then he said, you know, my sons don't have the heart for it because they think it's just a business. Mm -hmm. Then he said, your son, Jesse, he looks like he has the heart for it. Why don't you tell him if he wants to stay, I'll give him 200 head of sheep to start. I'll give him a Jordanian education and I'll give him a wife. Yeah, so we'll hear the full story on that. After a word about Tim's book, The Good Shepherd. Well, as we're learning, Tim spent months among Bedouin shepherds in the Middle East. And coming out of that time in his life, he put together a book that combines that rich cultural experience with careful biblical study and led him to the conclusion that this subject of shepherds and shepherding and sheep provides the most comprehensive metaphor of leadership in the Bible. And so in this book called The Good Shepherd, 
Dr. Tim Laniak offers 40 short readings that explore every leader's responsibility to provide and protect and guide. Each chapter begins with observations from Tim's travels and continues with insights into Bible stories and passages about shepherding and concludes with what this means for you in your own spheres of influence. The goal is to help you learn from our Good Shepherd how to lead in your home, and your church, your workplace, your community. The Good Shepherd, 40 Biblical Insights on Leading and Being Led. To look into getting a copy, go to our publishing website at ourdailybreadpublishing.org. It's a new enough release that it should be right up at the top of that webpage. But if you don't see it right away, you'll notice a search bar at the top of the screen. Just type in the book's title, The Good Shepherd, and it should pop up right away. Highly recommend Tim's book to you. Available at OurDailyBreadPublishing.org. And now, the you've got to have a heart for it part of our conversation with Tim Laniak about The Good Shepherd. You know, one of the things that was really fun interviewing shepherds was that on one hand, I was doing the work that you might consider an anthropologist or an ethnographer to do, which is you kind of go to another culture and you have a lot list of questions to ask. And if you're doing it in an academic setting, you have to meet certain standards and follow certain guidelines. I had the benefit of actually going and just saying, well, these are the questions I want to ask. And what I didn't do is I didn't start with the Bible and say, well, tell me about this or tell me about that, because I wanted to know what it felt like for that world to be so familiar hmm. that I could reread the Bible. But one question I couldn't resist asking was, have you ever lost any sheep? <laughs> 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 and to my surprise, you know, like everyone said, oh, yeah, yeah, lose them all the time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thought, wow. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And we were at a sheep market one morning, which is a really wild and chaotic place. And once they found out I was there with, you know, like somebody with a camera and an interpreter, all of a sudden people gather around. I said, you know, hey, look, just looking for some stories. Anybody ever lost sheep? And they dragged a guy over. For to be interviewed, they said this guy loses them every day, <laughs> and they just Must said, be the worst and the guy, the guy's ever. laughing, <laughs> and they said like his wife won't let him come home at night <laughs> until he goes back out and gets the lost sheep. That's cute. So I asked kind of the sheikh of the area to just sit down and talk about it, and he said, you know, look, when we lose sheep, we go looking for them, and he said we will look for them until we find them, and he said if we find one and we know it's someone else's, we return them. He said because. Mm. This is the way he put it. He just said, these are good people. Mm. Mm. They're not going to let their sheep go. And I had one woman who had a story that was almost identical to the lost sheep story. And Jesus, you know, like two years asking everyone, what happened to my you? What happened to my oh, you? Oh, goodness. Mm. And I was in this little block house in a very small village. And, you know, the, the dirt street between the houses, a shepherd from another area had walked through one morning. And she went out and asked him the same question, you know, two years later. I had lost you. And when the ewe heard her voice, <gasps> the ewe popped its head up. And if you see like even 100 sheep walking, they kind of have their heads down. It looks like a big kind of wool blanket that's mm -hmm. like rolling <laughs> down the thing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, one head pops up. Oh. And this lady and this ewe, they go like running towards oh. each other and she's hugging it. Oh. And here she is like a Muslim in the middle of. Jordan, she's not reading the New Testament, but she like calls all of her neighbors and friends and celebrates <laughs> and said, I had a lost sheep and I found it. You know, I love that. I don't know. Does that give you guys any extra color, so to speak, it about does. those very familiar stories? It does. Uh, I was just thinking that in the first conversation, we talked about metaphors. Mm -hmm. And of course, leadership in the church is pictured by the metaphor of a shepherd. And I know how it feels to lose a sheep. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a mm -hmm. member of our flock, a member of our congregation. And, you know, there are all kinds of different reasons why people move churches, and some of them are totally legitimate. Mm -hmm. But I have never fully understood a pastor who could say, okay, this is addition by subtraction. Yeah, they mm. might have left, but we're going to be better because they left, you mm. know. I mean, they were part of our flock, part of our community. Yeah. And it does create an ache yeah, it was stood out to me as a urban dweller who never had pets, mm -hmm. right? Was the 
mutual enthusiasm and joy, mm -hmm. the sheep heads popping yeah. up <laughs> and <laughs> the woman continually to ask. Right. Mm, and I think when I think up. about that spiritually, that might have been something I didn't quite capture in the lost sheep story. It was mm -hmm. all about the shepherd looking, but not as much about the desperation mm -hmm. even of what the sheep was looking for. Yeah. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that part of the, the image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of go from an inanimate coin in yes. Luke 15, right, to a sheep that you weren't thinking so much about, and yet you finally get to the lost son, right. and he's definitely saying, I need to head back. Yeah. Well, looking for a lost animal is like a particular role. And even when some people read the stories in Matthew and Luke about the lost sheep, they kind of get lost and, well, you know, did he actually really leave 99 alone? Did he put them at risk? Look at, you know, there's all these kind of questions people get lost in. But what would you say is the heart of the shepherd? that goes looking for a lost sheep? Like what's underneath that task? Yeah, to me at least, it would be a mix of concern for the welfare of the sheep and compassion. Uh -huh. Some combination of those things maybe. Yeah, and I think knowing better what the sheep really needs than the sheep might know or understanding the sheep's weaknesses, that he maybe isn't smart enough to find the shepherd all by himself. Sounds it, a little bit like parenting. It does. Yeah, there's a protective and compassion covering. Yeah, I was thinking protection too, and a sense of awareness of the dangers, like sheep don't have real defenses or ability to protect yeah. themselves or defend themselves. So it's like there's wolves out there, or there are other predators out there, or thieves out there. And mm -hmm. so... I think that all of that might come into the mind of the shepherd about the urgency of finding a sheep as soon as possible. Mm. Yeah. One of the passages that kind of sits underneath these New Testament ones we're maybe more familiar with, like the lost sheep parable or John 10, is not just Psalm 23, but Ezekiel 34, mm. where there's a much longer passage that talks about some of these compassionate, caring, nurturing qualities that God has and that he didn't see in other shepherds that were responsible for his flock. But here's a few phrases out of Ezekiel 34. I'll look after my sheep. I will rescue them. I'll bring them out. I'll gather them into their own land, pasture them on the mountains of Israel. I'll tend them in a good pasture. They'll lie down in good grazing land. They'll feed in rich pasture. I will have them lie down. I'll search for the lost, bring back the strays. I'll bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Wow. Mm. Mm. Any other qualities that you'd say that kind of taps into? If you do all those things, what kind of a person are you mm. as their shepherd? Well, you're devoted. Yeah. Uh, for sure. I mean, you're committed to this thing and not just to the thing of the task, but to the sheep themselves. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it. We can look at leadership, especially, as all about just getting stuff done, ticking the boxes, achieving goals. Mm -hmm. But this is an emotional, connective. Yeah. I think about it in the contrast of what comes before that passage in Ezekiel 34, where the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel and he's actually describing the shepherds of Israel in a very negative light. Yeah. Um, bad shepherds. Right. And these right. shepherds are really exploiting and harming the sheep. And so it's in that contrast, yeah. that foil, yeah. that God is saying, I'm going to be the good shepherd because you all are really mm -hmm. endangering my sheep. Yeah. Were bad shepherds common? I think it's a really important observation because almost every shepherd passage, except Psalm 23, which is more of an independent one, almost every shepherd passage is in the context of bad shepherds. <laughs> I had another amazing encounter with a Bedouin who I interviewed more than once because he was just so good. I had a conversation with him when I said, have you ever lost any sheep? And he said, nope. He said, I got 2,000 sheep. And he said, every one of them's accounted for. And I said, N never lost. And he said, well, yeah, we lose them. But he said, I found every one that was lost, he said, except for one. And he said, every night when I go to sleep, I think about that one. Wow. Anyway, so that was one conversation. But when I went back, I had my son who was only 12. I said, you know, what does it take to be a good shepherd? And he said, you got to have a heart for it. Like, this is one of many times when I feel like God's saying, did you hear the echo? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, I heard that in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 3.15, I'll give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead yeah. you, like you said, Elisa, with knowledge and understanding, but the heart's first. So then he said, you know, my sons don't have the heart for it because they think it's just a business. So I'm thinking, that sounds like God. Mm. Family business, you're not mm -hmm. eligible if you don't have the heart for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then he said, your son, Jesse, he looks like he has the heart for it. If he wants to stay, I'll give him 200 head of sheep to start. I'll give him a Jordanian education, and I'll give him a wife. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's 12? Yeah. He was 12. 
So I said, you know, well, maybe Jesse needs some time to think about it. <laughs> I let Jesse squirm with the idea for a little bit because I wanted to see what he think. But it just the idea that the perception that this is not about skills. Hmm. Like when you were saying leadership, we sometimes, at least sometimes we think about what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. We also often reduce it to skills. Yeah. Mm. Can you manage conflict? Can you manage change? Can you, you know, do strategic mm -hmm. planning? And mm -hmm. like this guy's saying, that if you have the heart for it, you can start on Monday. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Just move in and we'll work with you. Yeah. Mm. If you don't have the heart for it, then go somewhere else. That's it's fascinating. Just it. Yeah. I think about the amazing statement in Ezekiel 34 of what it means for those who have lost hope in the church, who have experienced spiritual abuse, and in the context of that, which mm -hmm. is what Ezekiel 34 is talking about, God affirms, I will be your shepherd. Mm -hmm. And how powerful it is that God can even restore and redeem in the midst of those who've been wounded by bad shepherds and say, I will still be your good shepherd because I'm still there and present mm -hmm. even when other humans have failed you. We would encourage you to spend more time in Ezekiel 34, one of the great shepherd passages in the Bible. We didn't have time to read much of it, but having heard that part of the conversation, I think that will infuse new meaning into Ezekiel chapter 34. Well, you've got to have a heart for it. That's the insight that stood out to me in that section of the study. And next, Tim has another great story from one of those Bedouin shepherds that will add a dimension to that insight that, again, may have some surprises in it, but will add depth to this important image of shepherds and shepherding that we see in Scripture. I wanted to follow up on something, Rasul, that you've noticed in some of these passages already, and that's what you've called protection. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about the heart of the shepherd, and that almost always means for most of us a big heart, an open heart, a generous heart, a caring heart. And we saw that with looking for the lost sheep, wanting them to graze and, go, you know, just providing for them, nurturing them. I heard the word heart used a different way in another interview. And so I'll give you the scene. So Arabs typically in the Middle East, uh, you know, they wear a kafia, which is like a, yeah. the, we call it a headdress or a scarf. So I'm sitting with two guys with these kafias on and I'm asking them these questions again. What does it take to be a good shepherd? What do you have to know? What do you have to be? How does it work? How does the system work and all? So this guy says to me that his brother is a really good shepherd. And he says, because he's, and then he says something in Arabic, my translator says is stout of heart. Mm. So I thought, well, you know, sometimes when people have limited English, you get more insight. <laughs> so mm. it's like, this is a good kind of trigger. Like, what does that really mean, stout of heart? And so meanwhile, just to kind of give you the scene, there's like this little blind goat that he's holding. Oh. So it's like kind of walking around us and you kind of get this nurturing shepherd. And he said, well, my brother's stout of heart, so he's good. So my first thought is, okay, I, I get the heart thing. But he said, when we move around, we have to check out places. It's a pretty significant thing to make sure there's no scorpions, snakes, and then of course the bigger predators. So he said, we found a cave near where we were gonna settle. And he said, we saw the droppings of a hyena. Hyenas don't have good sight, but they have big jaws and they use them. So they will sniff somebody and if it's prey, possible prey, they'll just crush it. So he said, we saw some droppings of hyenas and he said, we saw a cave up on a hill. So my brother tied a few of our kafias together, put it around his ankle and he crawled through the cave to make sure there's no hyenas. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and we were gonna pull him out if he ended up oh. getting into it. So he said he's stout of heart. So then all of a sudden oh. I started thinking, you know, stout of heart, this reminds me of the uh, yellow brick road and the, the lion who wasn't- The cowardly uh, lion. Yeah, the cowardly lion. You kind of think, I realize, you know, there's something here about courage that has to do with protecting the flock. And so hmm. this was really kind of a game-changing insight for me to start looking for the protective role of the shepherd. And I wonder if you've seen that in scripture or in your experience even further than we've already talked about here, because the desert's not only, you could say, inhospitable, it's also hostile. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Wow, and just to be clear, so they were use the kafias to wrap <laughs> around his leg in case he was killed by hyenas yeah, or injured pull, or yeah. injured he right. could pull him out wow and that's, that's only one of many 
bravery stories I heard? You know, I go to several things. One, my son's name, Ethan, means steadfast heart. So mm. I, that phrase is it, when I've held a long time. And he named his son Cade, which means like barrel-chested stout, uh-huh. you know. So it's interesting, the metaphor of it. Yeah. I remember my family and I, we were, had some opportunity to have some family therapy and the therapist just made the observation that my daughter probably wasn't socially, emotionally mature enough to go right to college. She was a senior, but she had just turned 17. She was young. And I remember initially being like afraid of, yeah, we're not going to allow you to go straight into college because you're not ready. Hmm. And it not being a discussion, it being a decision and literally thinking, is this going to in our relationship as we know it, is there going to be a sense of just bitterness? I mean, we prayed and fasted and it just became clear and clear. This was the right call. I remember just saying, okay, this is what is the right thing for her as a father. This is what needs to happen. And, you know, she was disappointed, but (laughs) <laughs> Later on, ironically, we found out that we were called to New York City. So she ended up being relieved that she wasn't stuck in a school in the Midwest when we were on the East Coast. But mm. at the time, mm. it was like this took that sense of I need to do the right thing, even if it alienates mm-hmm. me from persons I love. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that does take courage. <laughs> when you use the term stout heart, my mind mm. immediately went to soldiers who sacrifice themselves mm. in battle mm-hmm. for their comrades. You mm-hmm. know, to me, that's an idea of what stout heart could look like. Yeah. It's just maybe for many of us, it, it isn't the first thing we think of when we think of a shepherd. Mm. Right. right. And even when you think about the, in First Samuel, David's introduced twice. There's one chapter where David's a shepherd. Saul needs someone to play music for him. Yeah. Right. But there's another chapter when he's the guy who says, I killed a lion and a bear, yeah. and I'll kill this Philistine. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like David's the warrior musician, and that's what you expect out of a shepherd. Yeah. You expect him to have a heart that's got the sentimental capacity to care, to muse, to reflect, to be the one with the staff. But then he's the one with the rod in hand-to-hand combat. So, you know, it's interesting, Bill, you talk about people that are in situations when we think of like, like that's courage. Yeah. And one of the things that I've noticed in groups where I've kind of facilitated conversations about leadership around this metaphor, how many of you are more like nurses, childcare workers, social workers, pastors, right? How many of you are like that? And how many of you are more police, military, Mm -hmm. security, cybersecurity, right? And then for how many of you did that vocational choice come out of a certain preference of either being more of a soft heart or stout hearted, right? So here's one of the challenges that I see coming out of scripture is that shepherds are introduced to us, whether it's God or the shepherds of Israel, as people that need to be both. And so in Ezekiel 34, which Rasul's mentioned a couple of times here, my flock lacks the shepherd, so the flock has been plundered. Like, the shepherd has to care enough not only to provide mm-hmm. for them, but also to say, i got to make sure that when they're out there, they're not going to be at risk. So then you have to pay more attention to data in a way. In our world, you have to pay more attention to things that you don't want to. And there's a liability we have from our wiring if we only want to do one. Yeah. So you have some teachers in elementary schools that's like, I don't want to have a metal detector. I don't want to know what drugs look like. You know, if a police comes in and says, we want to show you what drugs look like so that you can recognize them, whatever. Some people just just don't want to know that. I only want to know the good stuff. There's a liability for the kids. Yeah. And I think what God's saying is I want shepherds after my own heart. He's not just saying I'm looking for people that care. I'm and looking for people that care enough. Oh, that's good. To do the hard thing, like you were saying, Rasul, to actually put at risk even the relationship because you absolutely know what's best long term, right? That's that's a big decision. And didn't Jesus just model that hugely? I mean, we see his heart of compassion, you know, for the poor, the infirmed, etc. But yeah. we also see him call out in a very unpopular situation, people who yeah. were not willing. And then you watch him go to the cross. I mean, mercy. Right. Thank you, right. Lord. Again, thinking about what a stout heart looks like, as you were just describing some different things, Tim, my mind went to the first responders on 9-11 who mm-hmm. ran into the buildings right. mm-hmm. while everybody else was running out. Right. Um, you know, this isn't a professional or researched opinion about gender, but when we see men in situations like that, we're often 
either surprised or highlight the fact that they're also gentle. Mm. You know, like they care about their children too, right? We think, think of it as an, almost an anomaly. We actually seem to be used to the reality that women who have mothering instincts are automatically both compassionate and courageous, both hmm. providers and protectors. So I don't know if that's just true in our culture. I don't know if that's fair. I should, you know, ask you, Elisa, if you if you notice that. But my wife would jump on a grenade sure. to protect my kids. Sure. She would have. I just don't feel like I have to say, is there both? The instinct is just incredibly powerful. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think a, a, a mom will absolutely, I mean, you, you've heard the illustration of a, forest ranger after checking the hot spots in a fire and he came across um, a hen that was charred the body was charred and he kicked it and all these little chicks ran out from underneath the body oh, so it's wow. so so graphic wow. but you yeah. know i i really do think to give credit to dads in the same way i think dads have the same kind of courageous soft heart um, for their children and more so in our modern culture when that's the role is supported and allowed you know you've got a lot of quote mr moms today and i'm thrilled for men who can embrace both sides yeah i know i grew up in a home where it was assumed that we would wait till my father got home to get disciplined. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I didn't used to say, your rod comforts me. <laughs> <laughs> Except it's about justice. It's about equity. Yes, it's yes. about having someone that you can trust to manage for the behalf of the whole. Yeah. And one verse that I really keep coming back to is about Paul. Because Paul uses a lot of a language that's female, that's motherly, and he uses language that's also military. It's, he's mm-hmm. shepherds, a lot of things. But he says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, 21, What do you want? (laughs) Do you want me to come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come to you in love and with a gentle spirit? Mm -hmm. And the part that's not written, I feel like he's saying, you know I can go both ways. (laughs) So you you take your choice. He's just saying, this is my role. Yeah. Yeah, there is a stout side to having a heart for it. Being gentle and courageous are not always mutually exclusive. Shepherds have a stout heart. Well, have you ever played Follow the Leader or maybe Simon Says? So are those games leader games or are they follower games? Well, actually, they're both, aren't they? For the games to work, you have to have both a good leader and good followers. And those who aren't good followers, well, they lose. So next, Tim Laniac wants the group to discuss how followship is built into the idea of shepherding. And they'll do that right after a quick timeout. Now, if you're enjoying this Discover the Word podcast with our friend and co-worker here at Our Daily Bread Ministries, Dr. Tim Laniak, I want to let you know about Tim's connections with our Our Daily Bread University. Go online to ODBU for Our Daily Bread University, odbu.org, and type Tim Laniak, spelled L-A-N-I-A-K, in the search bar. You'll see a bunch of courses and other contributions Tim makes to ODBU, including a fairly recent one on Shepherd Leadership. That's a free course that would be an excellent follow-up to our Discover the Word conversations, and I think would also be a good introduction to the wealth of Christian education available through Our Daily Bread University. Tim's course on Shepherd Leadership. Hope you'll check it out at odbu.org. And now, let's listen as Tim explores how following is built into shepherding and the fact that the Bible probably has more to say about our being good followers than it does about our being good leaders. Being a person without any experience with sheep and shepherds (laughs) coming from Boston, out there learning everything new, one of the things that's just epic is watching a shepherd alone walking and having hundreds of sheep behind him. Hmm. It's just breathtaking. And I've come over a hill in the morning, like sometimes we go out interviewing, we didn't have a schedule. You just go out looking for a cloud of dust and you know, <laughs> then, you, then you move in and then the dogs start barking and then you have to wait for them to be called back and then you eventually get invited in for tea. Oh, wow. But came over the top of a hill and I just saw like these concentric circles of sheep hmm. and there was definitely a few hundred of them. And as we came over the hill, the dogs started to bark And in the middle of all those circles, a shepherd stands up. (laughs) They're all just there, hundreds of them, just there like that. And then if he starts to move, they all get into formation. And of course, it it takes a family. It's not as simple as just Uh one person. But 
I had one shepherd who sort of sarcastically said, if you want to know so much about flocks and shepherds, why don't you just take my flock out? And I said, yeah. So like, I'll go open the gate and walk and look over my shoulder and they'll all be still in the pen looking at you. (laughs) And he actually just immediately said, yeah, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, the idea of following is built into this metaphor. We talked about how like, to say that God's a shepherd, it wouldn't make sense unless you had a flock. You're just yeah. not a shepherd unless you have a flock. And, and if the flock's not following you, you're not their shepherd. Yeah. Mm. You could be a false shepherd, to use a biblical phrase. You could be a thief. Mm. So this one guy who said, you can take my flock out, ironically, he said, yeah, you're right, they won't follow you. He's had his flock stolen three times. Mm. And so you have people in countries where sheep herding is common. You have a lot of people who become very effective with animals. And so what they would do is they'd come in at night and they would silence the dogs, give them a little bit something to eat, and then maybe poison them, and then just start ushering the sheep out as if they're shepherds. And so it can happen. Wow. But it makes me think about John 10 differently as some background. My sheep listen to my voice. The good shepherd, he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. They don't recognize a stranger's voice. The sheep have not listened to them. I have other sheep, and they'll listen to my voice. And so this kind of gets to something that Rasul's mentioned more than once about, you know, fault shepherds and kind of this predatorial and hostile context. So this relates to how we started with, are we listening to God? Are we watching him so that we follow him? But I just wonder if we can move from compassionate providing and courageous protecting to this idea of guidance, which is what a lot of people think of when they hear the word mm-hmm. leadership. Yeah, and it's, I think, what a lot of people think of when they hear the word shepherding. I mean, even those of us who did not grow up in the Middle East and have not had your depth of experience with shepherds and shepherding, when we hear that concept, certainly in a biblical context, we think of the shepherd out there with his crooked staff and he's walking and the sheep are behind him and stuff like that. He or she, because women were shepherds too, right? Yeah, still are. Yeah. yeah. And it takes me back to such graphic imagery of Psalm 23. All this yeah. provision of him guiding yes. where we're supposed to go yeah. to have our needs met. Yeah. I don't know if this is where you're going or, or where the passage is emphasizing, but when I hear the sheep hear his voice, when I read that, It almost seems like there's a built in expectation or responsibility that caused the sheep to say, am I listening to the shepherd's voice? Right. And if not, then what voices am I listening to when you gave the example of the thief Mm -hmm. that can come and maybe even mimic or pretend to be the real shepherd when they're just trying to steal the sheep. It just makes me think about, is Jesus calling us to be the type of sheep to say, hey, you need to be listening to my voice? Yeah. The challenge is for us to listen well Mm. and to lead people by helping them listen well rather than, you know, trying to close them off and and have that sometimes predatorial instinct of our own. Like, Mm. I I don't want them to hear anyone else. Well, we actually want them to resonate with a divine voice so well that if we're off, they won't go off. Yes. You know, there's cultures around the Middle East and Eurasia where... It's traditional that you wouldn't have one of your sons, for example, be eligible to take a flock out until he had successfully stolen one of the neighbor's animals. <laughs> I had a translator, I was talking about that, and he said, oh yeah, that's what my father did. And he started laughing about how his father had stolen a couple of sheep and he'd hidden them in a cave. And the parents never knew, so when the neighbors came looking for you know who the thief was, they said, he's been with us the whole night. Like just, there's this bravado. It's like, I'm so good at being a shepherd. I can be a bad one. Like, you know, put it in biblical (laughs) terms. Like, so you say, so when people say, well, this is a common thing in leadership, you know, like, well, do you define leadership in a way that you'd ever say Hitler was a good leader? Mm. Mm. Well, if it has to do with followership, Mm. he was that in spades, right? Yeah, Mm. correct. So the question in the Bible isn't, you're not a shepherd if you're not that. It's a question, are you a good one Mm -hmm. or are you actually more like a predator? So you could be called a wolf, a false teacher, false prophet. You could be called a thief, but they're basically all the same thing. Anyone who has a sense of responsibility over any group of people at some point is going to battle with that predatorial instinct and it becomes an internal struggle. Well, whose voice are we listening to? Exactly, Yeah. 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 I want to ask you guys to consider something. It's a shift in topic, but if you think back on God's shepherding in the wilderness, the original wilderness journey, how would you say God led? By what means was he leading them? 
pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Right. His presence in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then how else did he lead them? Through Moses, a yeah. shepherd leader. Yeah. I would say when I think about the various trials that mm-hmm. they went through, mm-hmm. like yeah. he used them to shape yeah. who they were and who he wanted them to be. Yeah. So the itinerary was actually a learning journey, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then if you think about God's very personal leadership in the desert, how would you compare that guidance with this massive deposit on Mount Sinai? Like, here it is. This is the Constitution. These are the the rules of engagement. How do they kind of fit? I mean, in one sense, when we think about the manna, you know, where we get the concept of daily bread, there's this almost mundane but consistent, more subtle sense of presence. But then when you get the giving of the Ten Commandments and the law, earthquake, you know, smoke, cloud, lightning, it's this very dramatic, definitive moment. Mm -hmm. And it seems like holding those all together paints a fuller picture of the type of presence. I think sometimes we can get so caught up in the dramatic moment Mm -hmm. that we forget about Mm -hmm. the mundane provision. Yeah, Yeah, and I Mm -hmm. think you're onto something there, Rasul, and if I can just kind of piggyback on it, the manna and even the periodic miraculous provisions of water, those were momentary things, but the law was given to endure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it strikes me that uh, coming out of the desert, they had two complementary experiences with the divine shepherd. One of them was, he's with us, Mm -hmm. and we know what to do because he's with us and we can look, we can follow. We can listen if Moses had a meeting with him. But he also gave us this huge collection of laws to live by. And I don't know how much has really changed for us. Yeah. Mm. We have God's spirit. We have his presence. He leads through circumstances. He leads through his provisions and what he does episodically for us. But then on the other hand, we have the word. And it seems like that's what the church has God's presence in both ways. It's not as though the book is dead. It's what God wanted to communicate as a shepherd for all time. Mm -hmm. But then he also communicates with us like kind of a daily bread way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Tim. I'm just kind of connecting some dots in my head. The symbol of God's presence among the people beyond the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two of the three things inside the Ark of the Covenant was a pot of manna, Mm -hmm. daily provision, and the tablets of the law, yeah, the ongoing. So Mm -hmm. both of those representations, plus Aaron's rod that budded, but those two specifically in the context of what we're discussing were part of that representation of God's presence among the people. And traveled with them wherever they went. That's good, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just kind of close this topic with a picture that you can have in your minds. If you've seen in the Middle East, there are these valleys that have kind of notched trails Mm -hmm. across them, kind of going horizontally and... They're only the width of one sheep or one goat, you know, and they're on a trail. And so in Psalm 23, it says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. I call those righteous ruts because they're meant to be metaphorical, that God has paths and the Torah is a path. It's a way, it's a road, but then he leads me by his presence. And that's all still true. It's all just waiting. And and if you lived in that world, every time you'd see a, a wall of notched paths, you'd remember they don't all lead home. Yeah. There's only one of them that leads home. And if you have the benefit of visibility of the shepherd, great. If you don't, you still have the word. You know, you still have the path that we're on. An important piece of this conversation we're having about shepherds and shepherding. Because following is built into the metaphor of shepherd in Scripture. As Tim said, followship is where leadership begins. Well, one more insight left in our conversations with Dr. Tim Laniak, and this one comes from a saying that Tim picked up from those Bedouin shepherds that reflects a biblical perspective. Life is a camel and a tent pole. So how that saying is a description of your life as a follower of Jesus is what we'll discover after we take a peek ahead at what the group will be studying in our next podcast. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Daniel Ryan Day leads Elisa Morgan and Rasul Berry and new group member Vivian Mabuni in a study called The Pharisees. So when I say 
Pharisees, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots of rules and outward behavior. And yep. perfection. And yep. presenting perfection at all times. And judgment. Mm -hmm. Legalistic. Mm -hmm. The bad guys. Mm, yeah. The bad guys. Mm -hmm. There's even a dictionary entry that if you look up the word Pharisee in the dictionary, comes up a self-righteous person and a hypocrite. Whoa. So there, there's a stereotype <laughs> for us. But what's interesting is when we look at the story of the New Testament in particular, there's a few spots where I think some Pharisees play a positive role in the story. And so I thought it would be fun over these next couple of weeks to explore some of those examples of places where maybe the stereotype is helpful at times, but where it's also wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it should be fun. Mm -hmm. um, does that sound good? Sounds great. I'm excited. Right. Thanks for digging this out for mm -hmm. us. Let's mm -hmm. do it. That's next time on the Discover the Word podcast. And now the conclusion of The Good Shepherd with our guest, Tim Laniak. Well, Tim, it's sure been great to have you with us this week. This has been a rich study on mm. shepherds and sheep, on leading and following. It's just been a great time, hasn't it, again? Mm. Yeah. We've learned so much. Mm. Yeah. So where are you going to take us for our final talk? Well, we started by musing a little bit about metaphors. You know, are they important in mm -hmm. the Bible? And if they are, what do they accomplish? I've come to the conclusion, personally, that I think metaphors carry a lot of freight in the Bible, that they're not isolated. But I wonder if you agree that if you could double click on shepherd, <laughs> where would it take you in the Bible? Well, not just to shepherd, but to sheep. I mean, mm -hmm. the first place my mind goes is, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, Jesus is the good shepherd, but he's also the lamb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We go back to Abraham and the offering, you know, and Isaac, the son, and God providing the offering of the ram in the bush. And it's just such, you know, from the beginning to the end, this understanding of our need as sheep for someone to, mm -hmm. to guide us because we go off on our own. I didn't quite grasp the fullness of this until these conversations and hearing from your insights. But I do see a parallel with the meta narrative of scripture. If we look at the framework of creation, fall, redemption and restoration through the lens of the shepherd sheep relationship, because even if we go to Psalm 23, one, the Lord is my shepherd. Like, you know, there's this aspect of, I mean, it's not really creation in the sense of Psalm 23, but he's the one that we know created us in the first place. Mm -hmm. But then the insight about sometimes we don't listen, mm -hmm. right? We don't hear his voice and that's where fall comes in. It creates the need for our redemption, the good shepherd who's willing to lay down his life for the sheep in a hostile and broken world. But ultimately that leads us in the path of righteousness and fullness of being able to lay down in green pastures, yeah. you know, yeah. at the yeah. end of the story. Yeah. Again, I'm trying to connect dots all over the place, especially <laughs> within the context of the meta narrative. You talked about the stout heart, yeah. that there's courage involved, there's risk, there's danger involved in being a shepherd. And I mean, you think about the very first person who was ever murdered was a sheep tender right. Right. and his brother was a tiller yeah. of the ground. And yeah. that's where their conflict came mm -hmm. because yeah. of their occupations, which drove into how yeah. they offered worship. Yeah. And you just follow that idea from Genesis four all the way through with all the imagery of God as our shepherd, Jesus being the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I mean, I don't know how yeah. you can read the Bible without seeing metaphors mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too that the training room for so many leaders in scripture is the shepherd room. You know, it's mm -hmm. Moses yeah. and just how long he spent learning about God in this silent mm -hmm. season when we don't hear much from him. Yeah. And then David being prepared to be king yeah. of Israel. You know, you didn't mention Abraham when you mentioned, you know, so Moses and Let's David. Let's go back to Abraham. Well, That's if right. we go back to mm -hmm. Abraham, there's mm -hmm. something interesting that pops up in the New Testament. Because Abraham's mentioned like four different writers in the New Testament is pretty substantial. Mm. But when he shows up in Hebrews, he's like a model of faith as a pilgrim. And I think that's part of where this kind of double clicking on shepherding starts to give us a hint of this bigger arc. Like coming out of the Garden of Eden, there's a dispersion, there's a scattering for judgment. But there's another kind of dispersion and scattering that Abraham represents mm -hmm. when God literally sends him to the world. Mm -hmm. He's through the world. He's blessing the world. Mm -hmm. 
And you kind of have these two different kinds of scattering. And when Israel goes into exile, God promises that he'll retrieve them. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to be a good shepherd, bring them back from a judgment scattering. But in the New Testament, when the good shepherd comes, he sends them out in a blessing scattering, Mm -hmm. you know? And Mm -hmm. so then as you kind of move toward the end of the New Testament, you're actually anticipating this final scene that you were getting at, Rasul, when the good shepherd finally has us lie down forever, Mm -hmm. finally. And that's how Psalm 23 ends. That's Mm -hmm. why Psalm 23 is kind of the whole story of the Bible too, because I'll be in his presence forever, lying down. So listen to this verse from Hebrews 11 about Abraham. And this is actually in Hebrews chapter 11, verse nine. By faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, Mm -hmm. who were heirs with him of the same promise for he was looking forward to the city Mm. with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And I love what happens when when Israel goes through the 40 years in the desert. When they come into the promised land, they were given the Torah to become kind of this constitution for living together in that space. And on the first fruits festival, Mm. when the descendants of Cain, you know, the farmers are giving their offering, they have what you could call a creedal statement. Like, Mm. what do we say that we believe? Mm. But they don't say we believe in one God and three persons. They don't say we believe in the Holy Scriptures or what. The creedal statement is, my father was a wandering Aramean Mm. and he sojourned in Egypt, (laughs) (laughs) right? Like, that's what you say when you're farmers to say, this is who we are. I think that's a reminder that this storyline in the Bible wasn't, how do we get people into the promised land so they stay? It's how do we use the deserts where people wander and the so-called permanent places where they stay? How do both of them echo heaven? How do they both drive God's people eventually to heaven? So the promised land wasn't the end game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's this really powerful verse in Jeremiah that says, Israel's enemies said about God's people who went into exile, they didn't know the Lord who was their true pastor. Wow. Mm. So it's like, wow. Even the promised land was a temporary placeholder. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you get to these books like James and First Peter and Hebrews and Revelation, and it's like people are still on the move, mm-hmm. waiting. They're waiting, and our heroes are the people that lived in tents. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that was heavy. Phenomenally deep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yep. I'm going to the garden. and Because... Right. There, you know, man and woman were created, Adam and Eve, and they were given the responsibility to care for God's creation. They were given the responsibility to shepherd. Mm -hmm. And so this long journey, pilgrimage as you're calling it, is to call us back, bring us back to that creative intention. Which becomes the prototype for the heavenly reality. Yeah, and it also reminds me of the value of how God holds together both the agricultural and the shepherding. Mm -hmm. It sounds like Mm -hmm. in ancient times, much like in current times, we can find our identity and project too much about our career path or the way that God is providing for us in a way that puts all the energy in the thing versus Mm -hmm. in the God who gave me the thing Mm -hmm. and then even can cause me to look down on other people who have another thing, right? Right. Somehow God is saying, regardless of the manner of the provision, I am the good shepherd Mm -hmm. and that trusting in me and hearing my voice Mm -hmm. is the main thing, regardless of where you might find yourself. That's so Yeah, yeah, that's great. It just turns out I was with people from 44 different countries that were gathered because they were all church planters. And most of them were church planting in places that were not only remote, but they were unreached people groups. So a lot of them were doing the work of evangelism and often with a lot of hostility. Mm. But it reminded me again that we're more part of a movement than we are part of an organization. And the idea that you're on the move, Mm -hmm. it doesn't sit well with every temperament. But settling is what Israel didn't do well. Because settling is also something that we can get suckered into. And when you're with people that are on the frontier of the Christian movement, it reminds you that that's what we are. We're in a movement. And the real rest, the capital R rest, Mm. it's at the end of this long Mm -hmm. journey. The Bedouin have a saying that life is a camel with a tent pole. It's just the mm. ephemeral, transitory nature of their life. They can move in an hour. It's like if, mm. if a storm's coming, if there are raiders coming, you just get up and go. And so 
I have one picture in the book that's at the very end, kind of like on what home means. Mm. And it's the last verse of Psalm 23, you know, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But it's a picture of a tent mm. with those ropes that come down to hold it and a little girl that's like just hanging onto the ropes because that's her home. Mm-hmm. She gets that. Mm-hmm. They're not really longing for a building. They have something in their heart that makes them who they are. But the anticipation for us is that there'll be a place like that's pictured. And so I wonder if one of you just read Revelation 7 to bring this to a close these verses about the Good Shepherd giving us the provision, the protection, and the guidance kind of all in one finale. I've got it. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Mm He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Yeah, from beginning to end in the scriptures, we see this image of shepherds. And at the very end, we'll clearly see that our good shepherd was always protecting, always providing, always guiding. Well, this has been another episode of the Discover the Word podcast, and you're around the table with Bill Crowder, Rasul Berry, Elisa Morgan, and our Senior Vice President of Global Content here at Our Daily Bread Ministries, Dr. Tim Laniak. And as we wrap up the series and conclude our time with Tim, uh, we just want to say thanks to him for taking time to share with us what he's learned about the power behind the shepherding metaphor and how when properly understood, The heart of the shepherd really does reflect the heart of our good shepherd and the type of relationship God wants to have with each of us. Now, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study style Bible engagement effort of Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Well, thanks for listening, and thanks to many of you for supporting financially the work of Discover the Word and Our Daily Bread Ministries. As one of our Discover the Word listeners put it, your support helps provide others the needed encouragement to imitate Jesus in their daily walk. So I hope you will consider joining us in our mission of making the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world by checking out the Donation tab on our website, at discovertheword.org. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.